Today we're going to be talking about antimatter, so let me just get some really quick. Here we go. And a little more. Perfect. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking that I've finally lost it and the quarantine is getting to me, but fear not, internet stranger, I'm no crazier than I was before. I'm not sure if that makes that better, though. Anyway, these items do actually contain antimatter, albeit obviously very tiny amounts, otherwise they'd explode and take out most of the neighborhood as soon as they touched anything. Today, we're going to build a device that will let us detect the antimatter inside here, and in other common items. So first, what is antimatter? Well, everything you've ever interacted with is, well, matter. That is a collection of 12 fundamental particles that can be mixed and matched to make atoms and molecules and just about everything else. These 12 particles make up the standard model of particle physics and are the basis for most modern physics. But of the 12, these three are the ones that you encounter the most. These two are called quarks, and when you get three of them together, they form protons and neutrons, which make up the cores of atoms. And then this one is the humble electron, which is responsible for holding different atoms together, electricity, and lots of other phenomena. But as it turns out, all of these particles actually come in two flavors. Matter, and their antimatter counterparts. The weird part is that antimatter and regular matter are almost indistinguishable. They have the same mass and most of the same properties. The only difference is that their charges are flipped. So an electron, which is normally negatively charged, its antiparticle, called a positron, is, well, positively charged. And if you get enough antiquarks together to form an antiproton, it would be negatively charged, rather than positive like a normal proton is. But other than that, they're identical. You can actually make entire atoms using nothing but antiparticles, and their properties, as far as anyone can tell, are the same as normal atoms, other than that charge flip. Scientists have made antihydrogen, for example, using antiprotons and positrons, and when they looked at the spectrum of light it puts out when you excite it, it was identical to normal hydrogen. Which, personally, I find fascinating and very, very weird. So now you're probably wondering, well, okay, well, how does that relate to my spinach and salt? Where's the antimatter in that? The answer comes thanks to potassium. In nature, potassium comes in three forms, known as isotopes. Basically, these are atoms which have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, making some slightly lighter or heavier. Remember, we classify elements by the number of protons, so as long as that doesn't change, they're all considered the same element. One of these isotopes, potassium-40, is ever so slightly radioactive and unstable, so over time it'll eventually decay into either calcium-40 or argon-40. On the whole, it mostly turns into calcium, doing so about 89% of the time. It does this via a process called beta decay. One of the neutrons in the potassium core spontaneously turns into a proton and in the process ejects an electron. And while this is cool, it's not what we're interested in. That other 11% of the time when it decays into argon is when things get exciting. Rather than one of the neutrons ejecting an electron, in this case, one of the protons can absorb an electron and goes the other way, turning into a neutron. But this leaves the core of the new argon atom with way too much energy, and it needs to get rid of it somehow. So it does this by emitting a very high energy form of light called a gamma ray. And it's that gamma ray where things get weird. Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, shows that mass and energy can be sort of interchangeable. But while that is the most famous version of the equation, it only applies to very low energy situations. The full equation is E squared is equal to mc squared squared, plus pc squared. Basically, this means that energy is actually proportional to both the mass and the momentum of a particle. So in a sense, if you can provide enough energy to cover the mass of a particle, you can generate new particles, basically out of nothing. But there's a catch. To make new particles, you always have to make two at a time. This is called pair production. An electron has a rest mass of 511 kilo electron volts. And a positron, being otherwise identical to its matter counterpart, also has a mass of 511 kilo electron volts. During pair production, you always make one matter particle and one antimatter particle. So in this case, all you need is something with a combined energy of greater than 1022 kilo electron volts, and you can make a pair of particles. Remember that gamma ray from the potassium decay? It has an energy of 1460 kilo electron volts, which means that it passes the threshold for pair production. But some basic math shows that 1460 minus 1022 leaves 438 kilo electron volts left over. So in order for pair production to happen, a third criteria needs to be accounted for. The gamma ray needs to pass near an atom, 
This way, the particles can be formed, and it can pass off that excess energy as momentum to the atom, giving it a little shove. When these conditions are met, we occasionally get two new particles, one of which is antimatter. When I say occasionally, though, I mean it. This does not happen with every single gamma ray. There are basically four ways that a gamma ray can interact with matter, and the probability of each method changes based on the energy of the gamma ray. Past about 1000 kilo electron volts, or 1 mega electron volt, while it is possible to get pair production, the probability still isn't very high. But as you approach 10 mega electron volts, the probability climbs significantly. So for your average banana, for example, which contains approximately 350 milligrams of potassium, you get one positron every 75 minutes. As you can imagine, that would make detecting this very difficult. So to make the probability higher, and hopefully detectable, I'll be using about 2 kilograms of various potassium salts to provide enough potassium-40 that I can more easily detect the positrons. So now we've got our antimatter, how do we detect it? Well, antimatter doesn't tend to exist very long on Earth because of the sheer number of matter particles everywhere. As soon as that positron comes in contact with an electron from a nearby atom, the pair annihilate, and release two more gamma rays this time each carrying 511 kiloelectron volts of energy. Using a device called a gamma ray spectrometer, we can detect not only that first gamma ray from the potassium, but also the resulting annihilation gamma rays from the positrons that are formed. So let's build one! This is my gamma ray spectrometer, and we actually used it in my last video to determine what sort of radioactive material is in these quack medicine negative ion bracelets. If you haven't already seen that, I'd highly recommend checking that video out. The spectrometer is made of three pieces. A crystal, which turns any gamma rays that hit it into visible light, a special vacuum tube which will turn the light into electrical signals, and a box which takes those signals and feeds them into a computer so we can interpret them and make a spectrum. Let's start with the crystal. There are a variety of different materials that will work for this, and I actually built two probes using two different materials. The first is called Bicron, and is actually a special type of plastic. The other is sodium iodide, doped with a small amount of thallium. Bicron is cheap, so you can get huge chunks of it for not a lot of money, but has a significant flaw that makes it basically useless for our purposes. When a gamma ray hits one of these materials, the flash of light that's emitted is approximately proportional to the energy of the gamma ray. Or at least, it should be. With Bicron, the flashes of light are kind of all over the place, and while it almost always makes a flash of light, you can't actually use them to figure out the energy of the incident gamma ray because it's just so sloppy. Sodium iodide, on the other hand, is much better but also more expensive, and can be used to figure out what energy the gamma ray was, as the flashes are proportional to within about 6-8%. to Still not perfect, but very reasonable and sufficient for our purposes. Beyond sodium iodide, the price of crystals shoots up very quickly, but so does the quality of the spectrum they produce, and the size of crystal you need to get a good spectrum decreases as well. Ultra-pure germanium, for example, needs to be cooled with liquid nitrogen to work, but gives flashes that are within 0.2% accuracy. Here's two spectrum showing the difference between germanium and sodium iodide. You can see how much sharper the peaks are with germanium. But again, for our purposes, it would cost thousands of dollars to set up. Whereas my sodium iodide crystal only cost about 150 because it had a small crack in it. Okay, we've got our crystal, now let's talk vacuum tubes. This is a photomultiplier tube, and they are amazing. Using some honestly really simple physics, they can turn a single photon into a huge electrical signal, which is very easy to then pick up and interpret with a computer. Inside, there's a series of plates that are each charged with a high voltage that decreases with each plate. When a photon hits the first plate, it knocks a couple of electrons free, which are accelerated at the next plate. The electron hits the plate, knocking even more electrons free. This repeats all the way to the end, where at that point, so many electrons crash into the plate all at once, that there's a big spike of electricity. What's really cool is that spike is also proportional. So if more photons hit the first plate at once, more initial electrons are knocked off and the end pulse is larger. Finally, this box is where all the magic happens. It's the GS USB Pro from a company called Gamma Spectacular. My friend Steven Sesselman runs the company and was kind enough to send me this one. Honestly, I love this thing. It's really easy to use and it's packed full of features. And compared to the price of a gamma spectrometer normally, it's really quite affordable. So if you're interested, I've put some links in the description. I originally got the photomultiplier tube as a kit that came with all the instructions for setting it up, and it was actually quite easy. It was a little bit of soldering to set up the high voltage lines, and then mounting the BNC connector in an end cap made of PVC pipe fittings. Then everything was held together with black electrical tape. This not only holds everything together, but also insulates the tube so that no stray light can get in and ruin your readings.
Before it was totally taped up though, the crystal, or bicron, was cleaned with a microfiber cloth, and some silicon optical coupling grease was added to the face. The crystal was then mounted onto the tube and carefully rubbed back and forth to distribute the grease before being taped down permanently. Then the whole thing was covered in a second layer of tape to really make sure it was light tight. With the bike run, there was actually an extra step in there where you have to wrap the outside in white Teflon tape to make sure any photons that are emitted inside are reflected back into the tube. That process was maybe the biggest pain in the ass ever and took over an hour since the tape kept being statically attracted to my gloves and coming off. Once everything was taped up and sealed, the last step to make this permanent is to add some heat shrink tubing to protect everything. For the sodium crystal, I added a little bit of thin cardboard to make the shape a little more even, since the PVC was a little bit chunky. Then I just slid the heat shrink over it and hit it with a heat gun carefully. I also added some foam to the crystal end to help protect it from bumps. For the Bicron, the heat shrink was a wee bit too small, so getting it on was a nightmare and I ended up having to do it in two pieces. But when everything was said and done, I had two awesome probes ready for use. I ended up picking up a special cable to connect the probe to the Gamma Spectacular since it uses a weird connector called Safe High Voltage, but the cable only cost 15 or 20 bucks from China. But other than that, everything just connects together easily and the box is plugged into my laptop via the USB port. The first thing I had to do was calibrate the detector, so I used one of the thorium laced bracelets from the last video to do that. Thorium, or rather the things it decays into, put out a variety of gamma rays of known energy, so I can use them to calibrate my detector. Steven provided me with a little calibration sheet which I've linked to below that lets you adjust the voltage you're feeding into the tube until the peaks are spread out in a linear fashion across the whole spectrum. This is important so that anything that I measure will give me an accurate reading of what energy the gamma ray was. I'm using a program called PRA which takes the audio signal that the Gamma Spectacular puts out and turns it into a spectrum. First, I calibrate the peak shape of the audio signal by collecting about a thousand pulses so that PRA knows what the pulses should look like. Then I capture a spectrum for about 15 minutes and since I'm using a thorium source, I should get a series of peaks. I highlight each peak by clicking on it and then hitting either the F, G, or H key, which will highlight more or less of the spectrum. The goal here is to highlight just the peaks. If that's being a bit glitchy, I can just use the B and E keys to mark the beginning and end of a feature. With the peaks highlighted, the program gives me the mean values and standard deviation of each peak. These can be fed into that spreadsheet so that I can see if I've got the right voltage. If the graph is curved upwards, I turn the voltage down, and if the graph is curved downwards, I turn the voltage up, and I just repeat until the graph is flat. From there I calibrate the actual energy of each peak by using the known values of the thorium decay chain and plugging the arbitrary unit values and known energies into the calibration window. After that everything is set up and the spectrometer is ready to use to measure some actual samples. Let's start with the potassium salts to give the best chance of detecting the annihilation. If we can see it then we can be sure that anything else that shows the potassium peak should be doing the same, even if it's harder to detect. Here I've got a mix of potassium chloride and potassium phosphate, for a total of 2.1 kilograms of salt. I just piled everything around the detector and let it run for a day to give a nice clear spectrum, but you'd see the potassium peak in even a minute of starting the recording. Sure enough, there's a gigantic peak at 1460 kil electron volts from the gamma ray the potassium puts out, just as we expected. But now if we look at around 500 kil electron volts, sure enough there's a tiny peak. It's really tiny, almost lost in the noise, but the program does see it. That is the annihilation peak. One of the reasons it's so hard to see this is because I'm doing this without any shielding, so the ambient background radiation makes this much more difficult to detect. What's preferred is to do this experiment in a lead box with anywhere from 4 to 8 inches of lead on all sides. Here's another potassium-40 spectrum taken by Peter Daly, with much better shielding and the peak is actually a little more visible. But without either a big lead box or a more sensitive crystal, or ideally both, this is really right at the threshold for what's possible with this setup. As I said before, pair production is more likely the higher the gamma energy is. So on a thorium spectrum, for example, you see the annihilation peak at 511 is much stronger since there's a lot of higher energy gamma rays, which are more likely to undergo pair production. Which, as a fun note, means those quack medicine bracelets also put out a little bit of antimatter on top of all the rest of the radioactive garbage they emit. But no matter what, once we start getting gamma rays above the threshold, we do slowly start getting a small amount of antimatter. All of these pale in comparison to an isotope which just emits positrons directly. Sodium-22, for example, decays directly via positron emission, without undergoing pair production, 
So the annihilation peak that you get when analyzing it is massive comparatively. Another place where you'll see a very large annihilation peak is actually on an airplane. The atmosphere is so thin where commercial planes fly that the levels of very high energy gamma rays and other cosmic rays are much higher compared to sea level. So you get lots of pair production and a very detectable annihilation peak. If we now measure the spinach, we see mostly the same thing, though of course the annihilation peak is now way too small to see. All living matter has potassium in it, which means a small amount of potassium-40, and as such, you'll always see the potassium-40 peak. And as long as that peak is there, we can be sure that we're getting a few positrons. But the amount of potassium is so low in most things that detecting the positrons with this detector is just not possible. However, here's a spectrum taken from some wild-caught Atlantic salmon and analyzed with a vastly better detector. We see the usual potassium-40 peak, and the annihilation peak is now much clearer. We also see some cesium-137, which is a little bit sketchy, but not unexpected for something living in the oceans. Altogether, I hope this demonstrates that since everything you eat has potassium in it, you will always be eating a tiny amount of antimatter. In fact, there's actually a pretty decent quantity of potassium in you already, so part of the radiation that you naturally emit is a minuscule amount of antimatter. In an upcoming video, we'll be revisiting gamma spectroscopy again to look at another interesting technique called coincidence detection. Basically, we connect both probes together and only register pulses that set both off at the same time. This gives directional information, so one experiment is to simply stack them and aim them skyward so we can detect cosmic rays, and even perform some really cool measurements on them. We'll be able to see them decay within the detector into different particles, and should be able to use them to demonstrate time dilation and prove an aspect of special relativity. I'm also looking at maybe modifying Pipsqueak and turning it into a gamma ray camera at some point. But that'll be for future videos, and so I'll leave it there. Before I wrap up, I need to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi. Especially in these uncertain times, it's your amazing support that helps me keep making videos and work on projects like this, so I can't thank you all enough. If you'd like to help keep the flow of science videos coming, there's some links below. If you enjoyed, you know what to do. Hit the like button, subscribe, and of course ring the bell to see when I post new videos. If you'd like to see updates on these projects long before they make it into videos, be sure to head over to Instagram and Twitter where I post snapshots very regularly. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.